Welcome everybody to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex and this week's episode is going to be a Brothers War gameplay episode. So I did an episode like this during Baldur's Gate uh, that was really, really well received and I want to revisit this concept for Brothers War. So the idea for this type of episode um, is I'm going to cover some aspects of gameplay through the lens of some commonly played cards in the current format. Gameplay content, as I'm sure you know, a lot of you listeners know, uh, is typically really difficult <laughs> for content creators because, you know, every game is different. Um, but I did feel like it was a lot easier to talk about, you know, certain concepts in context, talking about specific cards. Um, I found it a lot easier when you have just like specific cards that lead to specific ideas. I say this a lot, but good gameplay is so, so important uh, when it comes to winning games of Magic. Like, so much focus is put on card evaluation and the draft portion, but good gameplay is really half or more than half the battle. Uh, so much of the time when I'm in a coaching session, the people that I coach come to me and they're, they're a bit befuddled sometimes because, you know, they, they bring me a pretty good deck and they're wondering like, oh, did I do something wrong in the draft? Did I miss some stuff? And it's like, usually it's like, no, no, you like... The draft went pretty well, uh, and it was often, you know, there's often big holes in the gameplay fundamentally. I also think that Brothers War is a particularly interesting format to talk about. Uh, if you listen to Limited Resources this week, Luis talks about how this format, um, the gameplay kind of feels like, you know, some older constructed formats, like Vintage Legacy a little bit, where there are a lot of micro decisions that matter. A lot of, really, you know, the games are really compressed a lot of the time, where You've got maybe five, six, seven decisions on, you know, before turn three. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to optimize on that. And uh, to build on that I idea, I think, a little bit, um, I think that's because there are just, like, a lot of ways to use your mana in small increments in this format through Unearth, or there's, like, you know, trinkety artifacts that cost one and two mana. So because there's, like, more ways to spend your mana in small increments... Uh, there are more permutations on a given turn of what you can do with your mana, and more permutations just means that there are more options and more room for error. So I think this is a really good format to cover some gameplay stuff. So anyways, hopefully the topics we touch on today in this today's episode uh, don't just help you in Brothers War, but can also apply to some formats down the line and give you some ideas for, you know, just how to play a limited better in general. Before we get into all of that, of course, gotta shout out the Patreon quickly, patreon.com slash limited level up, so you can check that out. If you like what we're doing here, if you want to support the show, and if you want to uh, get access to a bunch of cool reward tiers that are all pointed at getting you better at limited magic, whether it's the coaching tier or the uh, the Discord help tier, where there's a bunch of tiers over there that uh, will help you level up your game in some way. I've got I was just going through my uh, deck tech channel, my my you know uh, patron only deck tech channel on the Discord, and uh, this week I think I did something like a hundred deck techs <laughs> like it is a very very busy channel um i'm in there daily doing like you know just like 15 20 sometimes and uh you know i i enjoy it a ton i love just like having conversations with people about you know why i make decisions and, and stuff like that and i think there's a lot of value to be gained from that so if you want to check that out if you want to level up your game check that out patreon.com slash limit level ups i should also say that that you know discord help tier that's the one dollar tier anybody who signs up with the patreon gets access to that. So check that out if you're interested. All right, uh, let's jump in. So I want to start off with some of the most important creatures in the format, the Unearth creatures. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of them individually, the more important ones, you know, the mutt, the cohort, and the uh, the courier. But uh, before we get into specifics, I do want to just cover a few big picture uh, ideas about them when playing with them and playing against them as, you know, Unearth as a whole. So I've sung the uh, the praises of the cheap on Earth cards on multiple occasions in past episodes of my stream. You know, if you've listened to any limited level up slash Alex content, you're going to know that like I, I see these as form defining and there's there's so many good things that I could uh, say about them. Uh, so many reasons that if you put a scrapwork mud or a scrapwork cohort or combat couriers in your deck, you will win more games. But I think one of the biggest ones is they do a really good job in allowing you to take the role of the aggressor, if that's something your deck wants to do. So, I think one of the most difficult parts of playing an aggro deck is knowing when to throw away your board presence for some damage. Um, I, you know, I often call this like finding lethal over multiple turns, where you've got the opponents at a lowish life total, maybe eight or so, and you've got a board that's a little bit wider than theirs. Uh, and if you attack all, you can deal some damage. Some trades will happen. You don't quite kill them. Um, but also some of your creatures will get eaten if your opponent makes the proper blocks. Uh, the idea here is that if you throw away some of your creatures, then the next turn, you either get them low enough that you can, you know, you can kill them with a burn spell, 
or maybe your board is still wide enough that after the initial attack and some of your stuff got eaten and some stuff trade, you can still, you know, attack again for lethal. And I think this type of game state is really, really tough to identify for a lot of players because the, like, I should I attack question, like the thought process of when you're going to combat and you say, oh, should I attack here? A lot of times for a lot of players, I've noticed it ends when they go, I have a 3-1, they have a 4-4, their 3-1, or my 3-1 can get blocked by their 4-4 and it'll die. Okay, well, I guess I shouldn't attack. But it's really important to take uh, another step further, push yourself and say, okay, yes, one thing will die here, but what does happen if I attack all? And I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the years, just from the greats, from the aggro greats, I learned this from Ryan Sachs, who, you know, I always call out on the podcast and talking about learning about aggro decks is that when you're playing an aggro deck, the, the, the question that's just like buzzing on your mind so, so often is, can I attack all? Can I attack with these things? And if you can't attack all, you dial it back to it. Can I attack with three things, four things? And that, like, that's just like the, the, the main thing that is driving a lot of my decisions. And you know, Ryan, when I played with him, when I was uh, first, you know, just getting better at limited, he would ask that question so, so much. Can I attack all? Can I attack all? Can I attack all? And go, wow, you're considering attacking all in this spot? That's so crazy. And I think the unearthed creatures just really, really help you do that super, super well. Because, you know, bring this back to why the unearthed creatures are so good. They allow you to have more game states where you get lethal over multiple turns because you're just able to attack with everything. Some of your unearthed creatures trade off and then next turn, your board presence actually doesn't diminish that much because you just bring back your cohort, bring back your mutt and you would attack for lethal the second time, right? And, and that's really important to identify. It's it, like I said, it's very difficult if you're not already asking yourself that question of can I attack all? And, you know, if, if your creatures are only going to be relevant for one more turn because the game's going to be over, it doesn't actually matter if a few of them get eaten as long as you can get through those final points. And I, I note that it is tricky for a lot of players to identify this game state because um, on stream the other day, um, I was playing, I was playing like a, a multicolor green deck and my opponent was playing a blue-white aggro deck with quite a few unearthed creatures. I think they had like a cohort on board and they had like even like a Tokasia's Onulet, like the 4-4 four -four that uh, gains two life when it leaves. And I was pretty, like, I was ahead-ish on board, but I wasn't, you know, super, you know, the board wasn't super stalled out. Maybe it was, like, four or five creatures on each side. Uh, and I think my opponent, rightfully so, noticed that the game was slipping away from them. And, you know, with their few unearth creatures in the battlefield, they attacked all. And I had some okay blocks, but I was, you know, like I said, I was at that lowish life total I was talking about, where I was around eight. And chat was like, wow, crazy opponent. Like, why would you do that opponent? That's wild. And, you know, my instinct is, my, my first instinct when I saw them attack the way they did, I was like, oh, they figured it out. <laughs> like, they they found a line for lethal. They asked themselves that question. Can I can I kill them over to the course of two turns? And, you know, I, what I said to chat was basically, if that attack looks weird to you, I would imagine that you're not asking yourself that question enough of the time. Like, how do I get lethal over two or three turns? And it ended up not working out for the opponent, but it was so, so close and what happened is exactly what I described, where they attacked all, and the next turn, they went unearth, unearth, they even had, like, a bounce spell or something, and they were so, so close, and so it was, they took a losing game, a game that was slipping away from them, and really turned it into one that was a lot closer, so this really only applies when you have multiple unearth creatures in the battlefield, because, you know, if your opponent, if you just have one, your opponent's just going to choose not to attack, block your scrap for a cohort, they'll block the other things, right, and then you'll be left with the cohort, and you can't unearth it, but sometimes they don't have that option. So the more unearthed creatures you have on the battlefield, the more you should be asking yourself that question. And, you know, the funny thing is, another good thing, just like kind of jumping around topics here about these unearthed creatures is in a sort of funny way that they let you play the aggro game really well, but they also let you grind pretty well. And they, as much as they let you play an aggro game and put you in the driver's seat, if you would like to do that, if that's what you think your deck in the game state demands, they actually also allow you to grind and play more of an attrition game if that's what the game state demands. So a lot of the cards I'm going to be talking about today uh, some of the better cards in the format, they have this like really desirable attribute of being modular um, in that they let you play both ways, both aggressively or defensively, if you like. Um, and they just like are good in a lot of game states. Uh, Scrapwork Cohort is like, you know, one of the poster ch children for this. But there's a lot of cards like that, not just the Unearthed cards. So, you know, say you do feel like you should play more of a value game. Well, the Mutt, you know, you, you have a Scrapwork Mutt. You can block, trade that off, trade that in for a land, uh, you know, when you, you unearth it again. Scrapwork Cohort, same thing. You can, like, grind on the board. Combat Courier allows you to, like, sit back, maybe make kind of a, you know, a weird double block where you're losing the Courier plus something else, but also you get your card back. So I guess my big picture point on these unearthed creatures are they're very, very good at doing both things. And um, a big topic for, a big, like, theme for today's episode is going to be talking about cards 
that allow you flexible cards that allow you to be aggressive or defensive and uh, a big gameplay highlight is just like asking yourself what does the game demand of you and how should you use your cards because the best magic cards are flexible they are modular and it's really up to you to determine in the game state what they're supposed to do i i like you know i think a lot of the best players <laughs> they uh they maybe you know like a lot of pro players you'll see they'll maybe have like jump into these uh, arena qualifier events maybe not playing that much of the format uh and maybe there's like, a few cards you look at their deck that they did well with and you're like oh they're playing that card that's like, really weird and a lot of times it is about how you use your card right it's not so much about like oh they have this card in their deck of course they're gonna win or of course they're gonna lose the best players are really really good at just like figuring out how to use cards in different game states and not get caught in well i have a let's say scrapbook mod right where it's like this is an aggressive card, but it can be both, right? So just have that modular mindset. Uh, some words about playing against uh, an Earth quickly. So kind of the inverse of what I was just talking about. So when your opponent has a bunch of Unearth creatures and they go for an Alpha Strike, don't block the Unearth creatures if you can help it, because that just means next turn they'll be able to bring them back, like I was just talking about. Um, also be careful when your opponent has a lot of unearthed cards in their graveyard. You know, it, it's very um, kind of our intuition, I think, of like, oh, how much damage can my opponent deal me based on the game state or the board state? You kind of have a rough sense in your head where, okay, I'm at 12. I'm pretty safe. They've got four creatures. I've got three creatures. But like, you know, you attack with one wrong creature, one run, run flyer that you shouldn't have. And then they go, like, you know, unearth my mud, unearth my cohort, just kill you. Maybe there's a, there's a removal spell in the mix there too. So when your opponent has a bunch of creatures in the graveyard, unearthed creatures, like, consider them on the battlefield, right? And I think a lot of the time games, I won a lot of games by my opponent making that attack where they attacked one too many things and I just went, oh, okay, great, this opens up the window. Um, I have this removal spell I was sandbagging and so I can go, like, unearth, unearth, cast my removal spell, just kill you. So, you know, almost think of it like there is board presence even though it's in the graveyard. That's something to think about when you're trying to figure out those tough combat turns. Uh, one more thought, and this is much more of a deck building thing than the gameplay thing, but the question comes up a lot. I mean, the question is, when do you splash the good on earth cards, the mutt, the cohort, the, the courier? When do you not put any sources into your deck? Uh, so, so with scrapwork cohort and scrapwork mutt, uh, the red one and the white one, uh, gee, these ones I play just like almost 100% of the time. Scrapwork cohort in particular, I would have to have a really weird deck where I both like was not white and also didn't care about artifacts and you know, there's like a lot of things like there's so many things that uh, scrapper cohort synergizes with that i would play the card even if i couldn't unearth it now the thing is generally when i am in the draft i will prioritize an evolving wilds or a star or sentinel stalwart or something like that so i can but at the end of the draft if i don't end up with them that's kind of okay uh with for the mutt in the cohort when you get to combat courier that one's a little bit, uh, like, that's like, you know, the next level down of, of unearthed cards. It, it's about as good as the other two, but uh, I think like in the same tier, maybe at the bottom of that tier though. And it's one that I, I won't play if I can't unearth it or I don't have synergy with it. So I, I'll play it most of the time um, because I'll either be blue or I'll have some, you know, I'll have an artifact fall trigger, Yoshin Dissonant, or I'll have... Uh, you know, like a draw two theme, which I guess I'm blue at that point, or I have a, uh, you know, a goblin, like I played a lot in my goblin blast runner decks where I'm black red and I just need an additional sacrifice trigger. So this is one that I do need synergy more than uh, the other two, but at the same time, there's a lot of synergy that play well with it. And just like the other ones, it's not that hard to fit in a blue source or two somewhere in your deck. So the answer is play them way more often than not, <laughs> I suppose. But in the draft, do prioritize ways to unearth them if you can. Okay, so let's get into uh, these specific unearth cards. So starting with Scrapwork Mutt, which of course, by the way, I have not read this out yet, but two mana, two, one. When it enters the battlefield, you can discard a card. If you do draw a card, unearth one in a red. So the big question often with Scrapwork Mutt is what do you discard? And sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes, you know, if you have extra, extra lands and you need spells, you discard your lands and vice versa. If you have a lot of spells in hand, you need lands, you discard your worst land. Um, but... I would also say don't be afraid of pitching nothing. Uh, don't feel like you're missing out on value or something because, you know, if you have a tough time deciding what to discard, that probably means your hand is pretty good, right? And the the idea behind Scrapwork Mutt is it's there to improve the quality of your hand, right? So if you don't think discarding a card 
and drawing a random card from your deck will improve the quality of your hand, then just don't discard it. You know, you don't have to, it's, it's an option. Like on turn two, I will just not discard it, right? And it's still fine. Like, I, again, it feels like maybe you're missing out on value, but I guess the question you do want to ask yourself, and this is kind of a tricky question to answer, is, is the average card in my deck better or worse? Better or worse than the average, the, the worst card in my hand? And that's like, you know, a very on average question, not very easy to answer. But if you have any doubts that you might draw a worse card on average, or just you might draw a worse card in general, I would even like take out the average. If you think you're going to downgrade your card, just don't discard your uh, card, right? Um... Also, if you can play a different two drop on turn two, I will, you know, I'll play like my, a rock hunter or something. If I don't have anything in particular, I want to discard. Um, but if you don't have a two drop, you shouldn't not play your scrapwork mutt. Like just, just play your mutt. It's all good. Uh, you'll, you'll have a good time because you have a two mana play on the battlefield that later in the game, if you need to filter through your cards, you can unearth something. So, or you can unearth this thing. So don't worry too much about giving up value with this card. Uh, scrapwork cohort. So like I was saying, in aggro formats, it's really important to have cards play both ways or just be modular, let you race when you want to, let you uh, defend when you want to. And the great thing about Scrapper Cohort is it kind of lets you keep sketchier hands, in my opinion. Like, I found that both, you know, if I have a slowish hand, a cohort catches you up on turn four, um, but also it lets you not trade if if you don't want to trade like sometimes your opponents in the play and they play a 3-1 and you've got your own like 3-1 or maybe it's like an ambushed paratrooper where you don't really want to trade it off but you just like look at you know the damage race and they're on the play and you're like i probably have to trade off this you know i can't take three over the course of multiple turns but if you do have a cohort you it allows you to have the luxury of just being like okay i'm not going to trade off maybe i do take a little bit more damage but my cohort stabilizes me i can trade off my token i can trade off the cohort that means i can keep more of my game pieces around and i can play with my life total a little bit so you know I, I don't have to go deep on why cohort's awesome another thing i will say about cohort is that i prioritize unearthing it when you have a clean hit with it either the board is clear on your opponent's side and you get into that three damage or they have a three toughness creature that they don't want to trade with um, where by the time, you know, you're kind of trying to avoid the situation where your opponent has a X4 and they're just like, you're like, okay, pay three mana, get back a token, <laughs> attack with cohort, feign an attack, and, you know, maybe you bluff a combat trick or something, but most of the time they'll just block. I mean, if you have a combat trick, that's good too, right? But you do want to get it past, uh, you know, to the, you, you do want to cast it at the point of the game where you're going to get in some damage, I will say. Uh, combat courier. So this is the one mana, one, one that you can sacrifice to draw a card, unearth for blue, one thing uh, I will say about this card is it's very underrated still. I think even amongst pretty good players, this card just goes, you know, on the arena draft tables, it goes really late, uh, which, you know, is to be expected sometimes. But I I've even seen, like, you know, at, uh, at tables that mostly are evaluating cards where I would, this card goes way, way later. Uh, it's just great. Uh, I think it's, like I said, it's, it's pretty much in the same category or tier as Mutt and Cohort. Ever so slightly worse, but I think people treat this as, like, way worse for some reason. Um, it's just really good at all points in the game. It's, like, one of the great things about this card is it allows you to spend mana in small increments. And that's just, like, you know, it gives you a bunch of inflection points. So if you can spend one mana casting it, two mana to sack it, and three mana to unearth it and sack it. So, like, it allows you to fill in your curve anywhere you'd like to. And uh, a really important part of this format, I think, is optimizing on your mana and figuring out where you're going to spend your mana multiple turns in advance. So Courier fills this role of just f making it so that your curve isn't clunky, right? Like, you can play this on one, and, you know, if you play a one drop on one, I, I always feel really ahead in this format, and I feel behind if I don't and my opponent does. That's just great. Like, I groan when my opponent plays a combat Courier, you know, because it's like, all right, well, now my three one's not going to get in, and now they're going to have a little bit of, you know, just more material to work with. Um, so yeah, you play it on turn one when you have it, or you sneak it in at some point if you draw it later in the game, and then, like, you, you maybe block sack later. So what I do often with this card is I do plan out my turns in advance to see when I'm going to have the mana to be able to either cast it or sack it or unearth it. And that really uh, informs a lot of my other decisions of what I'm going to do with my cards. Like, should I play my three drop or my four drop? Well, you know, often it's the four drop, but sometimes it's like, well, this three drop is good enough and allows me to get this courier on board, and because I have the courier on board, I can spend my mana more efficiently the next turn, because I can play my four drop and sack the courier. So stuff like that, right? Just, it's all about planning your future turns. Uh, some questions I've had about this card is, like, when do you crack it? When do you sacrifice it? When do you unearth it? 
Uh, and of course, it depends. Usually, if I don't have um, any synergies to consider, I'll just crack it when I can. Like when, like I said, whenever I have the mana. But you do want to consider, like I do keep it on the battlefield if I have sacrifice triggers I care about in my deck somewhere. Uh, draw two triggers I care about somewhere. If I have might stone animation to potentially. So it's really a balance. Like it depends on what your deck is doing. Where the more of the stuff you have in your deck that you care about triggering, the later I'm going to want to wait on this card. Now, you know, once once you draw like four lands in a row, you kind of have to go like, all right, I'll just crack my courier and unearth it. Um, but I would hold out, and I do hold out a lot of the time if I have cards that care about it. Because when you draw your uh, Thopter mechanic or whatever it is that cares about drawing, it's so, so much better to get two triggers off of that and two cards rather than just the two cards. So... Um, yeah, and this is also, uh, by the way, this is a card I discard a lot to, like, Stern Lesson, or just, like, anything that discards for value, because, you know, just having this thing that sits in the battlefield, or sits in the graveyard, and you can pay three to draw a card at some point, is pretty valuable. I'm a little bit less likely to do that with, like, a Mutt or a Cohort, but, you know, even still, those are good things to discard, too. So, basically, just like all these Unearthed creatures, there it's very flexible, and there's a lot of different things you can do with it, and it's very modular, and that's a very good quality having a magic card. <laughs> All right, uh, just quickly, I want to talk about some uh, removal spells and kind of when to use your premium removal spells in a format where, you know, there are some pretty nasty bombs that you kind of want to reserve your removal for. Often the question I'm asking myself when I'm asking, uh, should I use my removal spell, is what is the function of a removal spell in my deck? And what I mean by that is, Removal spells, they, they do different things, both in different game states, in different decks. In your red aggro deck, your removal spell is going to be used differently than in it would be in a black grindy deck. In your aggro deck, it's, it's just there to push damage for the most part, right? You're just like, well, get a blocker out of the way. In your black deck, you don't care that much about answering even something like random obstinate bailoth. Like, I much, much rather try to block an obstinate bailoth than use a go for the throat or an, or an overwhelming remorse. Because... When it comes down to it, it's just a 4-4. You can block that. Maybe you have to trade some stuff on it. But in your grindier decks, you're going to need to save your removal for the important cards, for the bombs. And I'm sure you've had a lot of games where you're like, okay, I'll kill their like, kind of annoying creature. And then they like next turn cast their Steel Serenith. And you're like, wow, that was a nightmare. So because your game, your deck is going long in black grindy decks, or just like any deck that you think you're playing a little bit of longer game, just be super conservative in this format about what you're actually casting your removal spell on. Like... Yes, if you're taking a bunch of damage, if you think you're going to take nine points off their two drop, sure, you, you got to kill that thing. But if you're in the mid part of the game and they have like kind of an annoying creature, but you can probably just block it or even better, dupe them, kind of bait them into a, a situation where they might use a combat trick and you can cast your removal spell in response, that's ideal. But if you're playing an aggro deck, like it still actually kind of applies, I would say, if you're playing an aggro deck, like I, I still wouldn't use my removal spell just like on anything that is a blocker, I'm still a little bit conservative, um, because, you know, there are some, even if you're playing an aggro deck, the games go not at that long, but there are some pretty cheap bombs in this format, uh, three and four mana bombs that need to be dealt with. At the same time, though, I am a little bit more, I'm a little bit less weary about just, like, snapping it off to get in for five damage. Um, so, yeah, just, just some general words, and I found a lot of success just, just being patient, just being patient with your removal spells in this format. You, you kind of just have to in, in a bomb-heavy format, where, yeah, like, it, it just might be the difference between you winning and losing the game if you just have that one more removal spell. Okay, next up, I want to talk about the Mill 3 creatures. So, Airlift Traplin, Falaji Archaeologist, or Falafel Archaeologist, as it's uh, fondly named at this point. Ravenous Gigamol, Tomoko Scrapsmith, and Blanchwood Prowler. So, the, the, this is, these are kind of like my soapbox cards for the format, where uh, the one thing I want to say about this is... Milling three cards in the abstract is a benefit. It is a good thing. It is not a bad thing. It doesn't matter that you have bombs in your deck. This is really, uh, you know, um, pull you up by your, your bootstraps, sit you down, have a hard talk. <laughs> but if, if, you know, if you feel bad, if you're not putting these cards in your deck because you have bombs, you are giving up some value. You, you're, you're giving up some game win EV. Because these are good cards, especially the good ones like Chaplin and Prowler. And I've seen multiple times people not put their cards in their deck because they have a Teferi, they have a Worm Coil Engine, they, they're afraid of milling the cards. So if you haven't heard the milling, uh, you know, fallacy discussion before, basically, like, your deck is random in the position of where a bomb is. It doesn't matter, right? So milling three cards, because that's random, you're just as likely to mill to that bomb where the next draw step is your Worm Coil Engine 
as you are to milling the bomb away. And yeah, it sucks. It feels bad when the, when the when you mill your bomb, but at the same time, because the deck is random, it's it's not stacked in any way. It's just the same as if it was at the bottom of your deck. Now, in you know, on in reality, of course, it wasn't at the bottom of your deck, but you have to treat it as such. Like the math, if you're just approaching it from a pure mathematical perspective, that's the way you have to approach it. So just put these cards in your deck when they're good cards, especially if you have unearthed cards. Um, I will say also that mill th milling three in the dark is just pure upside. Like it, it, g it gives you more information. Like if I would, if the beginning of the game, you know, the game asks me, would you like to mill three cards for no reason? Like say I, ha I had no graveyard synergies in my deck. I would say yes, because that gives me information of what is not in my deck anymore. And that's important. Like a good example of this is, um, I think I, I heard this story, I think from, uh, Cedric Phillips and the, and he was at the cold snap. It was either the pro tour or a really old tournament where cold snap was the limited event. And in cold snap limited, there was this mechanic called ripple. And what ripple said was when you cast this card, you reveal the top four cards of your library. And if there is a card of the same name, you can cast it. Um, and there was, it was open deck lists. And there was a, a single copy of a card in Cedric's opponent's deck. And you could choose to deny the ripple if you'd like. And you put the cards at the bottom. And Cedric knew that the opponent only had one copy. And the opponent still chose to look at the top four and put them on the bottom. And Cedric goes, why would you do that? Like, the, you know, he was recounting the story. Of, of course, he knows now after years of, uh, you know, thinking about it and just like being a better player. But he was stay saying at the time, he was like, I don't get it. Why would, why would they do that? And this is a very good player. And the reason you do that is because you have that information of what four cards are not coming, right? So just really, really, I, I like, I know it's it's so so tough, and I, I had to have you know sit there, have this stern conversation with a lot of players lately uh, when I'm doing deck text. But like, it just as bad as it feels, it just does not matter. It doesn't have an outcome on if you are going to win or lose the game. So yeah, that's my big you know soapboxy moment for these cards. The other thing I will say with this card, these type of cards though, is um there is a mini game to be had or kind of a decision to be had a lot of the time of do I take the card that I've milled or do I put a counter on my card and again this is a very de uh, game dependent game state dependent deck dependent kind of thing but I have a lot more often than I expected to just chose the counter and when I choose to put a counter on it's uh, a few situations one I've milled an unearthed card so I'm like okay I've actually like kind of gotten some value out of this card already so I'll just like put the counter on my airlift trap and I have a 2-2 flyer plus an unearthed card in my graveyard or I like just need to block like this happens a lot with ravenous gigamol which is the black one where I just go I need a 3-4 here uh I yes I reveal the creature but my opponent's attacking me and I just need a 3-4 here Phalogy Archaeologist, which is the blue one, uh, happens a lot for this one too, where a 1-4 is really good in a lot of board states, and maybe the spell it mills just like isn't that good, so I'll just make it a 1-4, right? So don't always feel like you have to get a card off these, because when you are making your Mola a 3-4, or your Archaeologist a 1-4, that is a card's worth of value a lot of the times, because it will hold back multiple creatures, right? It's virtual card advantage, so... Um, you know, there, it's not just how many cards do I have in my hand and on my battlefield when you're counting, like, am I advantage or do I have an advantage over my opponent's cards? A lot of times it's what's the quality of my card. And sometimes that body matters. Also with Airlift Traplin, sometimes it matters because you just like want to beat down and you want a 2-2 flyer and, you know, a 1-1 flyer in when your opponent's like kind of a little bit, uh, stumbling and you just want to get more damage in that it's just not going to get the job done. So, uh, again, another kind of group of cards where it really depends on the game states, but really think of it and don't auto just like pick up the card that the cards reveal because sometimes you just care about the stats more. Mishra's Bobble. Okay, so I've had a lot of questions about Mishra's Bobble, which is the zero mana artifact. Tap sack, look at the top card of target player's library, draw a card at the beginning of next turn's upkeep. So uh, the question, like the question I've got or the kind of the sentiment I've heard around this card is like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, what does it do? aside from being free on cards and mana. So um, the way to look at this card is it is a free sacrifice trigger, a free prowess trigger, a free draw two trigger, free artifact fall trigger, taps for mana with stall, where it does a lot of really good things, at all for zero mana. And yet it's not just free. Um, there are some hidden costs to it. Like I wouldn't just put Mishra's Bobble in any deck. Now it doesn't take me a lot to put it in my deck. I just need you know, a trigger or two, like a sacrifice trigger, a prowess trigger, a draw two trigger. But if I don't have anything, I, I've left this card out before. 
Um, the, the two costs that are associated with this card are one, a delayed draw is something, right? It's not like it's a, it's entirely free to just be like, okay, I'll draw my new card next turn. Like that, that matters. Sometimes you really need to draw something. You draw your bobble and you're like, crap. I can't like, I'm just dead. I need a, I need an actual card. Um, but also it obscures mulligan decisions. So there's a reason why constructed decks don't all just play four Mishra's bobbles. And that's if you have a opening hand with like two bobbles and a few lands and spells, you're like, well, is this bobble a land or is it a spell? I don't know. And I don't like, I'm not sure if I should keep her mulligan this hand. Now in limited, this comes up a little bit less because you're only going to have one bobble often, but it is a cost. It is still a cost, right? Like there's going to be times where it's like, well, I've got a, a one land hand, pretty low curve in a bobble. Like, that's a pretty tough card hand to mulligan, but also this bobble might just be a spell. So, yeah, it's not just free. It doesn't take a lot to put this card in my deck. Um, also, a small little uh, gameplay tip with, you know, Evolving Wilds. The trick you can do, of course, is often you're going to bobble your opponent for the information. Bobbling yourself. Well, I bobbled myself sometimes when I just, like, want to know what my next turn is going to look like. But often you bobble your opponent. But you also want to bobble yourself if you have Evolving Wilds often, because you get to go like, okay, well, bobble myself, see what I have. If I don't like the top card, I can shuffle it away. So one little one little small uh, gameplay tip there. A similar card, Chromatic Star. Uh, so one mana artifact, tap sack, uh, sack the, uh, add one mana of any color. And when the star is put into the graveyard from a bat the battlefield, draw a card. So two small notes here. One, uh, of course, this is like one that I think is pretty obvious if you've played with or against the card, but you don't need to sacrifice this card to its ability to draw a card. You can just sacrifice it to a Pendragon Strong Bull or whatever to draw the card and get a trigger. Um, also, I've seen this mistake. It's not like a straight mistake because there are situations where I could see this being correct, but I see my opponents cracking this on the end of their turn a lot of the time, and there's just like not that much of a benefit to doing so. Like, if you have an instant that you're going to cast, uh, like, uh, you know, you're, you're filtering for the blue mana, you have a blue instant, sure, of course. But if you just wait to untap and, and then figure out if you want to crack the star, uh, there's not a lot of downside to doing that because it's just, like, free to crack this with, like, one mana and nets you one mana. So just just wait till your turn. I think we have a lot of muscle memory a lot of the time for, like, well, I got to use my unused mana at the end of my opponent's turn when you can just wait on this one. Uh, just get more information. There might be a reason to keep it. You know, something I've definitely had this uh, experience where you crack it at the end of turn. Just kind of maybe, maybe I forgot that. Uh, like you know, again, muscle memory kind of kicked in, and then I draw a Mightstone animation. I'm like, oh crap! Like I maybe wanted this artifact just sitting on the battlefield. So, uh, yeah, don't don't always crack this on your opponent's turn. And in fact, do it less often than doing it on your opponent's turn because just like not that much benefit. Uh, okay, so a pair of cards here: Goblin Blast Runner and Pentagon Strong Bull. So. These are the, uh, you know, the core of the red aggro decks in my mind. And the thing I want to talk about here is very similar to what I was talking about with the unearthed creatures and just calculating the, uh, your, your math, combat math over multiple turns. And this is a tough one because <laughs> it, it's, it's going to, uh, you really depend on what the board state looks like. But I would say more often than not, like the question is often, do I sacrifice uh, aggressively to get my blast runners in? And I would say yes, most of the time, like, when you, just like with Cohort, with Scrapbook Cohort, where I said, you should unearth when you get a clean hit in, I often sacrifice with my Strong Bolt to get my uh, Blast Runner in, or any sacrifice trigger to get my Blast Runner in, when I can, uh, because you never know when your opponent's going to play, you know, their own Scrapbook Cohort, or something that makes tokens, where you think, okay, maybe they're going to play one card per, per turn, but then they have a really good card uh, turn where they go, like, play a creature, you know, play a Cohort, and play something else, and now my Blast Runner just, like, can't get in. Um, so, it's, it's Especially because the red decks have a lot of reach, like a lot of, uh, you have Strong Bull, you have, uh, you know, Excavation Explosion, you have a, a bunch of things that just deal incidental chip damage. It benefits you more often than not to, like, just get your opponent down to a lower life total. Like, the trade-off is often, am I going to sacrifice some of my board to get this in, like, aggressively, or do I play a longer game where I care more about my board and more about the resources? And, uh, you know, format with fewer burn spells or fewer good ways to just close up the game in a red aggro deck... I would say it's more important to build out your board and like make good exchanges on board and you're just like playing a more normal game of magic. But because there's so much burn and incidental chip damage to supplement you just like getting your opponent to eight and then killing them somehow, uh, it is better more often than not to just go for it. Now, if your deck is particularly short on ways to close the game, like no unleash shells, no explosions, then you do have to just treat your blast runners more as like, you know, 
normal creatures that sometimes grow, sometimes trade off, sometimes just like trade up for your opponent's cards. And, uh, and the opposite is true. If you have more burn, be more aggressive, throw caution to wind a little bit more often, basically. Uh, another one that is more of a deck building thing than a gameplay thing, but I did just want an opportunity to shout this out. So Citadel Stalwart, which, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about on the podcast last week. Sam Black had an entire podcast episode where he goes deep on five color green with Citadel Stalwart. And, uh, this is a great card. I'm a really big believer in this where you're just like multicolor having Stalwart fix you for a bunch of colors and maybe, uh, you know, getting you to extensive stuff. But the main thing I want to call out here is you, you got to lower your land counts when you got Stalwart. Like, I see a lot of people going like, well, if I'm playing this Stalwart, I'm playing this one mana one one that's just dead in the late game. Uh, it, it is, that is true if you're playing 17 lands. But if you're shading lands for these cards, then the opportunity cost is not, well, I could be drawing action when I'm drawing Stalwart. It's, well, I could be drawing Stalwart when, when instead I'm drawing a land, right? So if you're just replacing Stalwart with the lands... It works out to just, like, you're not really paying a cost. And because these are just mana sources, right? They're one mana cards that, you know, any opening hand with, like, a stalwart and a land or two, you're going to keep that. Uh, you know, of course, you want to have a cheap creature, too. It's it's just, it's so analogous to a land that you can not quite on a one-to-one -one basis replace them. But my most often configuration, or mo my most common configuration is, like, cut two lands, so go to 15 lands, with three stalwarts. A similar thing you can apply to Bushwhack, which is the one mana green card that goes and gets a land or, or turns into a fight spell. Very similar thing, um, but just like, this is the biggest, uh, you know, suggestion I make to people when they have a stalwart deck. Just feel more comfortable going down lands. I know it feels weird. I know for all of our life, it's like, play 17, maybe 16 lands if you're feeling spicy, but you can go down to 14, 13 lands if you've got enough of these things. You really can. Like, I did a deck tech today where the person had six of them, and I was like, yeah, you can play 14, 13 lands. As long as you have your first land, which is not that hard to have your first land or two, these are going to do their thing. And sometimes you're going to draw more lands. Sometimes, you know, you're going to draw fewer lands. But, it, you know, in the, in the time you drew fewer lands, you were going to mulligan those hands anyways because the solve would have just been a land in its place, right? So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a very small band of hands, of opening hands, where the hand would have been a keep if this stalwart was a land rather than a stalwart. So you're not really losing that much. Don't be afraid to cut lands. Boulder Branch Golem. So just a small note on Boulder Branch Golem. Uh, so this is the seven mana prototype creature, six, five, that you can prototype for four mana and it gains life equal to its power when, he, when it enters the battlefield. I really try my best with this card to cast it for seven mana. Uh, I prototype it when I really need to, but I really do try to cast other stuff. Uh, Mostly because gaining 6 life is a lot more than gaining 3 life, and a 6-5 is a lot better than a 3-3. Three, three. Now, you know, the 6 life is, that point doesn't matter if your golem comes in, gains 3, and then trades off with a 3 power creature that was just going to deal you 6 anyways. But a lot of the time, what happens when you cast it for the prototype mode is you play it, trade you to stabilize, trades happen, and then, you know, you're left with no more action in hand. And often, this is like my big thing. In my green decks that common that I'm like building towards. So I will say that like, you know, I don't know my opponent's hands. I don't know the texture of their hand and what makes them want to play certain things. But a lot of the time when my opponent plays a boulder branch golem on turn four, I'm like, great. That's like, it doesn't line up very well with my creatures. I have two mana, three power creatures that can attack into that thing. And, you know, I'm a little bit surprised sometimes when people play it for three mana because I'm like, well, they're not under that much pressure. Am I, I'm not pressuring that much. Their life total's not that low. Maybe they just like literally had nothing else to play. But in some board states, I just won't play this card when I like, even if I don't have anything else to play on turn four, like I'm stable enough. I'm just like, okay, like that's fine. I really just want to play this on seven mana. So just hold this a little bit longer, I think is, would be my advice. Two cards that I want to talk about that have similar play patterns here. Yoshin Dissident and Third Path Iconoclast. So Yoshin Dissident is the uh, white green uncommon. Third Path Iconoclast is the red-blue uncommon. I would suggest holding these cards until you can get a trigger on them a little more often than you probably are now. Uh, it is very tempting to play these cards on turn two because you play them early and, you know, as the game goes on, you're playing artifacts and you're putting counters down things or you're playing Iconoclast and you're getting one ones. And you're like, great, like I can really go off. But if you have the option to play another two drop, I generally would because... You know, it, it's often better to guarantee a trigger or two off of these than it is to play these on two and have them snapped off, 
right? Like, if you can go play your Iconoclast on 4 or your Dissident on 4 and then get a trigger, that's a pretty good turn. And these are great cards, awesome cards in your deck, but your opponent can take, like, they can make them not great cards by just removing them. And I know that sounds obvious, <laughs> but if you don't give your opponent the chance to do that, you at least come away with something. Now, again, if you don't have a 2-drop, just play them out, of course. But I, I do think... You know, get looking at some gameplay reviews. I think people run these out a little bit too often on turn two, just because they're like, "Oh, like I'm gonna get my engines going." When it's very likely that your opponent has a removal spell in their opening hand, and often, you know, sometimes it's like a disfigure or an explosion where it's cheap, and they don't don't mind just snapping you off on turn three or turn two or something. So, uh, you know, you really just want to put your opponent in a position where they can't use their cards efficiently, and that's a big theme through a lot of like games I play. Just like, you know, making sure that my opponent can't cast their disenchant that I know is in their hand, and I, like, I don't slam my five mana card in, and on, on the end of my turn, they get to disenchant, then untap and play their five mana card, like, all about, like, figuring out what you think your opponent has in the hand, and, like, maybe some, maybe your opponent has been telegraphing some stuff, that's not as relevant for these cards in particular. Um, the, the thing that is relevant, you know, related to that conversation, though, is you want to give your opponent a hard time in games, like, you really just want to make their life difficult, and you're making their life easy, if you just play these early and hope they stick. Another thing too is it really matters. Uh, it depends on what colors I'm facing. Like if my opponent goes uh, forest plains, I feel a little bit better about running out the Iconoclast. Like sure, they can epic confrontation, they can fight it, but there's not a lot of spot removal that just like cleanly snaps it off. If I'm playing against black red, I'm way, way more likely just to like hold it till turn four. Um, so colors definitely do matter. And, and I, I'm going to run it out some amount of the time because I have to, but you know, just the trends I've observed, people don't hold these often enough, right? They don't hold them until they get, get value out of them often enough. All right, uh, kind of to close out here, I have a string of cards that generally my uh, my my point about them is is basically the same. They, they just come through in a, a bunch of different ways or in a few different right ways. But the, uh, the, the theme of all these cards is what does the game need from me and how do I use the cards accordingly and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier with some of the other cards but a lot of the cards and these are just good cards are, are all very modular and with modularity like I said earlier comes with room for error because you will have a lot of choices to make you have room to make poor choices but you also have room to make good choices and and really make uh make the best out of the cards so mask of the jade crafter is one where this is the two mana artifact that you can sack it for X mana, make an XX unearths for three mana. This is a card that I think the default mode is make an XX where X is the amount of mana you have, right? But sometimes like you just crack it for three because you need to block your opponent's two twos. Uh, and then like later in the game, maybe you make a gigantic thing. I think a little bit too often I see my opponents just like hoping to hold out and make a big thing when they just like the need of the game that they, they, you know, what the game demands of them is they have an additional blocker this turn, right? Even if it just means, like, making a 1-1 one, one sometimes. Or, or sometimes, it's not that I need an additional blocker, but I need a trigger. I need a Yoshin Dissident trigger, right? An Artifact Fall trigger of some sort. Or, I have a Sarath uh, Steel Seeker in play, right? The 1-2 the that finds lands when you cast artifacts, or when you have uh, artifacts enter the battlefield. And I really, really would like to hit my land drop next turn, right? Without needing to pay additional mana on the next turn. So I will activate my mask for like 1 or 2 to get closer to a land, because I really, really need to cast my 4 drop or my 5 drop or something. Or like, get to my Titanius command. So, uh, you know, I think a theme amongst this card and the, and the last few cards I was looking at, the, the Iconoclast and the Dissident, is, like, extracting max value, like, this, this need to extract max value out of our cards at all time, and with this card, too, it's like, you just gotta do what the, card, what the, what the game demands of you, and it's okay, just like with the Mutt, too, it's okay to give up a little bit of value sometimes if it means that, you know, you're gonna keep pace with your opponent, so just ask yourself those questions a little more often. Uh, a similar card, Doctor Mechanic, which is the one in a blue, two one. Whenever you draw your second card per turn, you put a counter on it, and when it dies, you make a one one flying Thopter. Similar thing. It's very uh, tempting to be like, oh, I've got all these draw two triggers in my hand, and you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this a giant thing. Sometimes you just have to trade this off with your opponent, right? They're playing like red black or red green aggro, and they play a two drop, a three one. You trade that off. You trade that off instantly because part of the value of this card is that it's a creature it's a two drop creature that trades off into something like you're already ahead when that happens you don't need to like jump through all these loops you know, expect this to get up to like a, a five four or something just trade it off like you know some maybe maybe your hand is is such that 
you feel like you can take a few extra hits. You do have a scrapper cohort in hand where that stabilizes you. But, you know, I think so much of the time, I, I find my opponents not trading this card off when that difference of taking additional, like, three or six damage is really, really going to matter in the game. Gaia's Gift is another one, a very modular card. This is the green combat trick that puts a counter on something. That creature gains Reach, Trample, Hexproof, Indestructible until under turn. Uh, it's, it's actually a very good example of this kind of, you know, do what the card needs you to do or use the card in the way that the game demands you use it because it's, it's a very clear dichotomy between this card can be used to be aggressive or it can be used to be defensive. And a lot of time, I think when you put Guy's Gift in your deck, you kind of think of it as, oh, this is what's going to push through the final few points, right? But sometimes you're not the aggressor and you just need to treat it instead as, okay, this is going to be my defensive combat trick. Or you're in a spot where uh, you've got a bomb where you're like, okay, I, I really want to hold this guy's gift to protect my bomb because that's going to win me the game. So yeah, because this card is uh, very flexible, modular, it can be easy to lock yourself into, well, I'm going to use this card for this reason, whether it be attacking or defending. And as the game goes on, it's easy to not shift that and, and not shift your priors. But you know, if I if you take away one thing from this uh, from this episode today, it's just like keep asking yourself as each turn goes on, what do my cards do for me? Have the value of them or the uh, the function of what I need them to do in this game state has that changed as the game's progressed a little bit? Moment of defiance, very similar thing where it's just like this is the the three mana black combat trick that gives lifelink and draw a card. Sometimes the most important thing about this card is that uh, I cast it on when my opponent is tapped out. They haven't blocked. I'm just casting this on my three power creature to gain five life and make sure this sticks. Like some of the time, uh, you know, my I, maybe I'm putting my opponent on a removal spell because maybe they've like been playing in a way where I think they have a removal spell and my moment of defiance isn't going to be able to stick unless my opponent taps out on a future turn. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. So I want to just get my life, get my card. Uh, again, this is another card where it's like, you can imagine, oh, I, I, I hope to win a combat with this, or I hope to like trade up my small creature on their bigger creature, when that's just not the reality of what the game needs you to do. Because the other thing too, is the longer you keep this card in your hand, the the, the longer it's going to be before you realize what that mystery card that this card's going to draw is going to be. And when you have that information of what this card like, quote unquote, really is, you then get to plan your turns out a little bit better and, and, and you get to uh, just play your cards in a more informed way. So really just you know, consider firing off your moment of defiance a little more often. Uh, and then the last point I want to talk about here is, uh, you know, kind of, I've touched on this, but really just hammer it home. Tomical Honor Guard and Rock Hunter. So these are two, two mana, three ones. And my point here, and this has come up a lot in gameplay reviews I've done, is if you think that these cards are going to deal you six, nine points of damage, if you don't have a good blocker, or you have blockers that, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to trade off, just get rid of them. Like, sometimes you cast a removal spell on them. It doesn't feel that great, but you just have to because maybe you have some valuable creatures. Like, you, you know, you have an icon Iconoclast or something. Well, I guess Iconoclast isn't the best example because you're likely going to make one ones. But you have a Yoshin Dissident, and that's your two drop, right? And then it's like, well, <laughs> I have this Prison Sentence in hand, and that's what I could do on turn three. So either I block with my Dissident, which I don't want to do because I, I can see myself getting value on turns four and five out of this, or I just cast my removal spell on a kind of crappy creature. And as much as I was talking about saving my removal spell for bombs and stuff, that's, you know, it, it definitely ebbs and flows. Like, I had spots where it's just like, you gotta kill that that two drop on turn three because it's just gonna deal you six points. There, there's spots also where it's like, you have an ambush paratrooper, which is like, you know, the one-two flyer, and you don't really want to trade that off for like a Tomoka Honor Guard. But again, like, you're just not in a position to block this thing. And it, it you know, it's just gonna deal you too much damage. So, this is just a button on the conversation of really ask yourself what your magic card is doing in a given game state. Because the great thing about magic and one of the, the strengths of the game is cards don't just do one thing, right? There are card games where your cards basically just do one thing. And especially in limited magic where things are so different game to game, that's part of the beauty and part of the fun, at least for me, of like, how am I using my card in a way that best suits this game? And if you can figure that out, I think you're going to win a lot more games of Magic. All right, that is uh, the end of my cards I want to talk about today. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. We're going to, of course, send it to Twitch chat. Twitch chat, if you have some cards that uh, you'd like me to talk about, kind of just like the play patterns or how to best use them, throw them up. We'll talk about them. Once again, I'll shout out the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups check that out if you enjoy the show if you think you know 
You come back here every week. Maybe you'll, you win a few more games of Magic than you normally would. It's a great place to support the show and uh, tells us that, you know, you like what we're doing here. All right, first card, Jason. Jason ILTG says, I got here late. Was Bitter Reunion covered? It wasn't actually. So uh, Bitter Reunion's a good one. So Bitter Reunion, of course, two mana, one red for a enchantment, 20 ETBs. You discard a card, you draw two cards, and uh, it has the ability, one, sack it, to give your creatures haste uh, until end turn. Really good card, honestly. Um, Kind of maybe a little bit high praise. Sounds like I'm giving it super high praise, but it's a card I've come up on quite a bit as the format's gone on. Um, I think that it just does a lot of really, you know, it's kind of one of those cards that does a lot of small things that you appreciate. As it's a sacrifice trigger, it can give you value by putting unearth cards like a uh, combat courier in your grave. The haste is really big. Like, uh, I guess that's probably the most tricky part about how to use the card, like when to activate the haste uh, part of it. Like, I, something I had to adjust to is, again, thinking about how your damage is going to be spread out over multiple turns and when i first played with the card it, earlier in the format i was only activating it when uh I, I could go for lethal where i could kind of like go for a surprise lethal and more and more often i was just like oh no 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 if i just like play my i mean blast runner is obviously a great combo with it um but like play my blast runner play my like four power creature haste out here that's just like enough damage where it really swings the race and my opponent like has to be defensive. They can't attack, keep attacking me back. So it's another card that really asks you to look at the game state, really be, uh, you know, analytical about what's happening and just the numbers and how they're swinging. Uh, and I, I guess, I guess my tip for it is activate it more often than you th are now maybe, or, uh, or more than you think you should. Like, I guess maybe a good way to frame it is every time you play a new creature, uh, you know, because your brain doesn't often think this creature can attack, and so you kind of have to manually tell your brain, oh, yes, it can. Uh, just think, like, does this swing the race enough that uh, I'll be able to push enough damage where I can start taking the aggressive roll and my opponent can't crack me back? Uh, question here. Did you talk about the cares of a basic cycle? So this is... You know, the, these are the monocolored payoffs, and this is a little bit more about uh, deck building than gameplay, but I do think I will talk about them quickly. Uh, one thing I will note is I don't like them very much. <laughs> like, okay, so Blanchwood Armor in a actual mono green deck or like, you know, 15 forest, 14 forests, like, it's a powerful card, uh, but like, it's very rare I end up there. Corrupt is good, uh, but like, it does ask you to make some concessions to it, like, Playing a deck full of black cards isn't often the best thing because a lot of the black cards are, like, pretty good, but not great. Like, there's not a ton of home run black commons aside from the removal spells. A lot of their creatures are kind of dorky. So you have to be in this weird spot where you have, like, multiple corrupts so that you, like, are are paid out for playing mostly swamps. Uh, but then also black is pretty open where you're not, like, scraping the bottom of the barrel for playables. My big picture thoughts on the cards, though, are that people try to make them work a little more often than I think they should. Like, especially Flow of Knowledge, the blue one, like, that card's just, like, not what you're looking for. It's a fine card advantage spell, but you don't want to warp your deck around it. Uh, lay take down arms or lay down arms, the white one, the Swords to Plowshare kind of variant. That card is, uh, it's good if you have, like, all planes, certainly. And, and more, I think, monocolored white decks are a little more doable, just because I think that... There's more white cards I want to put in my deck generally that are just good, and I think white is kind of undervalued. Um, but I, I wouldn't, like, just like the other cards, I, I generally wouldn't warp my deck around them. Like, that's the really tricky one. Or that's the really tricky part, that a lot of these cards, they, like, they the, the payoff they give you is not worth warping your deck around. I think that Corrupt is, and I think that the red one, the um, the Cliff Stomper, that card's great, and Mono Red is already something, like, you kind of want to do. Uh, that card is just like, ex actually, like, I should talk that one up a little bit. Like, that card is just excellent. It's like a B plus if you are mono red. Uh, so it, it is worth warping your mana base. At the same time, though, you want to be honest with yourself and asking yourself, like, how much filler do I have to play to play this card? Because, yes, it's a great card, but if you have to play, like, six cards that aren't very good, then it's just better to play, like, some black cards or something that you picked up. Ah, Mightstone Animation. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Uh, so, again, a little bit more deck buildy than gameplay. But uh, I think that to have a good Mightstone animation deck, you want somewhere in the range of like mm, eight or nine artifacts that you are able to get into play by turn three, whether that be 
can stripping artifacts like refractor and elsewhere flask or power stone makers um i th it's a really powerful card that does require some setup and has diminishing returns because one it's a four drop two you often don't have like enough artifacts just lying around uh as far as gameplay goes i kind of just like treat it as a haste creature <laughs> and like in the way that you would treat a haste creature where you can kind of surprise your opponent with it like if you want to cast it on turn four and that's the thing to do great but often i i've had spots where i choose to not cast my stone animation and i cast a different four drop or use my four mana in a different way because i think i'll be able to surprise my opponent with a with a big hit of four uh so that's like my biggest gameplay tip but yeah it, it's a really funny card because it's like super super powerful but does require some deck building and uh, that deck building like even if you want to put the effort into it in the draft you you don't always see the cards that make it tick right um so yeah tricky card back to the whole like monocolored cycle how many flasks would you need to just like play it in two colors uh i think that the flask corrupt thing is kind of a gimmick <laughs> like i wouldn't play flask in a deck that otherwise couldn't play like i wouldn't include corrupt if i have flask in a deck that otherwise would not be happy playing corrupt um oh also i actually forgot to mention this all of those cards from that cycle like you just should not put them in your deck unless you have 12 13 of that land type minimum and that's like bare minimum and like the cliff stomper i think like needs all of your lands to be mountains in an ideal world you're just like playing actual monocolor because it's just such a disaster if you you draw like two of your other colors right or two of two lands of your other color and that happens a good amount of the time so uh yeah just like really really be again honest with yourself don't just jam them in when because it's like a pretty powerful card like it's very easy to imagine oh i drew like you know five swamps in my 10 7 deck but that's just like not gonna happen a lot of the time um anyway so about flask I would play Corrupt in a Flask deck if I had two Flasks, I think. Like, if, if I was, like, a 9-8 mana base, where sometimes I just, like, Corrupt for three, and then sometimes I do get to Corrupt more often, or, or for a bigger number, yeah, like, I think two Flasks is okay, but one Flask, it just doesn't happen often enough. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't jam Corrupt in with just one Flask. It's turning into a bit of a, uh, you know, what do you think of this card conversation, but that's cool, too. Uh, what do you think about Soul Guide Lantern? Uh, I'm way, way down on Soul Guide Lantern compared to Bobble and Star and Flask and Acre Wellspring. Uh, I think it is good to include when you have exactly Goblin Blast Runner uh, as a, you know, a cheap thing to just like cantrip and, and it's, you know, it's a can cantripping sacrifice trigger, basically. Um, but unlike those other cards, you don't get to keep the artifact around for cards like Might Stone Animation, or cards that, like, have you sacrifice an artifact for a cost. The sacrificing the lantern is part of, uh, you know, part of the cost for drawing a card. So you don't get to have your cake and eat it, too. So, uh, it's, it's, you know, you can make the argument where it's, oh, it's good against Unearth. And, I mean, it's true, it is, but that's not enough of a push towards me wanting to play the card. You know, uh, it's a nice little benefit to, or if, if I have it in my deck that already wants it, where you're like, okay, you snipe your opponent's cohort once in a while but even though like i think this is a a fallacy that happens a lot of the time and this is like a bigger picture point where you go thing a is really good in a format so i want things that are good against thing a right that makes sense but the thing that is good against thing a is not a generically good card and even though that thing unearth is good in the format it's not like you're gonna face unearth every single game it's not like your opponents are gonna have a million unearth cards so You've got to think about, is this card good against your average deck and against the field? And, you know, with, with Soul Guide Lantern, you could definitely argue that's a lowish, low enough opportunity cost card where if it's bad, you just sacrifice it. But again, that's still a cost. Um, I think that's like, you know, a, a, a big trend or a big fallacy I see where because something is good in the format, I, you know, Mono Red might be a good example or Red Aggro decks where people go, you know, a few weeks ago, the red aggro decks were the best thing in the format. And it's like, oh, do we want to, like, metagame against that and play, like, all cards that are good against red aggro? And it's like, well, no, because then you're going to face against the, the green deck and a lot of your cards are going to be terrible, <laughs> right? So just, just you know, a limited metagame is, you know, unless it's, like, super, super perverse and it's, like, there's only one thing that is viable in higher ranks and you're going to be, like, facing that thing every single game, you, you just can't, like, have pre-sideboarded cards because too much of the field is just going to punish you for that. All right, chat, uh, I'm going to pack it up from here. Thanks for hanging out, as always, this coming week, and it's going to be probably a little bit of an earlier podcast episode, maybe on Thursday if I can get it out. Uh, 
going to be Cube, the new Arena Cube that's going up specifically because it is a bit of a competitively minded cube because the Arena Open, which is next weekend, is going to be uh, a cube open with the, with the cube that's coming up. So look forward to that. The cube, I think, is going up on the 13th. Uh, so I'll probably want to play a little bit before I get the episode out. But yeah, that's going to be this coming week. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. As always, if you're listening, this is on the Limited Level Ups YouTube. Go follow us there if you want the visuals. And if you're watching this on YouTube, it's on the Limited Level Ups podcast feed. Uh, this is a podcast. I know some people, some people in the YouTube comments are like kind of confused about that sometimes. But this is a podcast, and you can listen to it on the go wherever you find podcasts. So check that out, and we'll see you all next time.